Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Chandler. Here's your talking points for this week. Well, it was a great week for Lubbock City Council and other local leaders securing re-election and for our streets. But elsewhere, the 2022 midterms left us with few surprises. We'll dive deep into what the results mean for you. And so much coverage of the midterms is about the numbers, often not enough about the issues. But it's now time for Texas to turn towards solving those issues. And the Texas Tribune is coming to Lubbock next week to discuss which of those issues are most important to West Texas. We'll hear about the future of rural Texas with the Tribune's founder and the authoritative source on all things Texas, Mr. Evan Smith. From the studios of KMAC Television in Lubbock, your local election headquarters, this is Talking Points. And happy Sunday. Thanks for joining us. Well, the midterm elections have come and gone, and the people have spoken, or at least some of them. By now, we've heard the prognosticating and the takeaways from this election. It was the red wave that wasn't. It was a worse-than-expected night for Texas Democrats. But the factor in this election that may deserve far more scrutiny is the huge amount of Texans who just chose to make themselves a non-factor. In the final weeks of this campaign, both Governor Abbott's and O'Rourke's campaigns were predicting turnout that could be as high as 10 million Texans. The real number, about 8 million dwarfed by the number of Texans who just did not vote even though they could. 9.6 million stayed home, and that's only among registered voters. That doesn't include Texans who are eligible to vote but just did not register. In Lubbock County, about 80,300 people voted. That's out of 187,775 registered voters, giving us a total turnout of about 43%. That's if you round up. Sure, there are much more people in Texas than in previous elections, so there will be more non-voters just naturally. The overall, overall turnout rate, though, is still about 45%. The good news for Lubbock City Council, though, is we'll soon be making a lot more room for all of those new people. The $200 million road bond, passing this time by a two-to-one margin, thanks to a much more active campaign from business interests and first responders, and about $100,000 of PAC money behind it. Now 22 miles of roadway will see construction very soon, and you will probably see a modest property tax increase of about $16 per year on average. This was a relief for city leaders who've been working on this for over a year and who have not made an investment like this into our streets for 13 years. Here's Mayor, Mayor Trey Payne on election night about what this means for you, no matter how you voted. I could not be more encouraged to see this happen tonight. I think it's necessary for our city, and I, and I do recognize that some people, uh, you know, were against it, and I don't, I don't blame it. Nobody wants to see taxes go up in this world today with inflation, things going on. But we also have to recognize that as we grow forward as a city, this is going to be helpful for, for us as a city. This is going to increase our infrastructure, help us have a safer infrastructure, and so I'm really, really encouraged tonight. And here's a look at the streets that the city says they will now get to work on immediately. Congressman Jody Arrington also sailing to re-election to represent District 19 for a fourth term. He was in a safe district up against an independent candidate, so he actually spent most of this campaign helping out other Republicans around the country. And we are still waiting on some races around the country to see the exact balance of power in the House, but Arrington sure was confident in his efforts on Tuesday. Two out of three, if not three out of four Americans are not happy with the direction of the country. I think most Americans are, are making the uh, association between the policies, the cause, and the effect of high inflation because of spending, the crime uh, for lack of accountability uh, just to, at the highest level, and then the border, which we're on the front lines here in Texas, and it's crime, it's gangs, and it's drugs. It's the leading cause of death among Americans 18 to 45 is uh, fentanyl and uh, opiates, and they're pouring across the country. And I think uh, people uh, are holding the single-party Democrat rule accountable, as they should. And a few other local races to highlight. Incumbent Jason Corley keeps his seat for county commissioner for Precinct 2. He first took office in 2018, Juan Gattaca giving him a challenge with just 29% of the vote. Corley's a Slayton businessman, and he says he's ready to get back to work. 
There's been a lot of things in my community that I wanted to change, that I wanted to fix, and I've gotten to do that. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, you know, we used to say, leave it all out on the field. I feel like I've done that for the last four years. There's, uh, there's no shortage of work, that's for sure. So looking forward to another four years of getting to go out and uh, solve those problems. <laughs> Definitely the most shocking outcome of Tuesday, though, was for Lubbock County Justice of the Peace in Precinct 3. It's former city council candidate Frank Gutierrez unseating Aurora Hernandez by a very slim margin. She held that office for 28 years. And as the balance of Congress is still up in the air, Republicans are still poised to take back the House, but not with as much force as predicted. All eyes were on South Texas to see how Republicans could make inroads in three districts there. And that's where our Monica Madden was this week. She joins us now to show how the Rio Grande Valley shaped out. Here in typically blue South Texas, it wasn't quite the Republican wave the GOP had been hoping for. But still, it's not stopping the top leaders in this state from declaring victory where they can. The state's top Republican touting wins for his party in McAllen Tuesday. We planted our flag in South Texas. The ground on which you are standing right now is now going to be represented for the first time by an Hispanic Republican woman. <laughs> Congresswoman-elect Monica De La Cruz smashing a glass ceiling. God. Becoming the first Republican to ever represent Texas's District 15 in Washington. My victory is not just a win for Republicans. It's a win and a victory for all South Texas. Despite her win, Republicans acknowledging other misses. South Texas ran the Republicans out of this area and told them this is not their home. They really underestimated people in South Texas. Incumbent Henry Cuellar topped GOP challenger Cassie Garcia in District 28. And in District 34, Congresswoman Myra Flores lost to Democrat Vincente Gonzalez, an incumbent from a neighboring district. The Republican tweeting, quote, the red wave did not happen. But experts say in the future, Democrats will need to step up their ground game in South Texas. Republicans invested in their candidates. They invested time, they invested presence, but we didn't see that same level of commitment with the presence or even the funding from Democratic national leaders. Although we just got through the midterm elections, there is already talk about 2024. And regardless of how Tuesday's election outcomes shook out in the Rio Grande Valley, you can expect this to remain a highly competitive area for the elections to come. In Edinburgh, Monica Madden, back to you. Monica, thank you. Well, as we watch these results solidify across the country and each side reflects on their wins and their losses, there will, of course, be a certain amount of disappointment and dejection for some. But we also remember that civility and allegiance to facts and a faith in our elections must win over. And I saw that spirit exemplified in watching both chairs of the Lubbock County Democratic and Republican parties on Tuesday night, working not against each other, but with each other to just make sure that that night ran smoothly. They stood together with me to share their thoughts as we watched the results roll in on Tuesday. And they stressed that their serious disagreements extend to the politics, not to the personal. Democratic Party Chair Gracie Gomez leaves us with a parting thought. I had a very interesting uh, conversation with a, a Republican. Uh, we were out putting signs, a Republican member, um, and we were out at shallow water, and we had a really nice civil conversation. And I think the important thing to remember is that after this, Yes, would we love to win, of course, of course. But after this, we have to remember we are all Americans, you know, and that that should be the common ground in, in, in coming together and working on behalf of what's best for our country and for our people and stop this divisive rhetoric that just seems like in the past, I don't know, six, seven years has been very prevalent. Good to keep in mind, Gracie. Thank you. Well, when we come back, we'll sit down with the co-founder of the Texas Tribune for a look ahead to next week when their event called The Future of Rural Texas will bring some of the top leaders of our region together at Texas Tech to focus on our priorities.